go. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. My name is Ralph. Um, I'm a researcher at Technische Universität München. And uh, you may have heard about all this stuff concerning SSL and man in the middles, the digital nota meltdown of this year. So what we propose is, uh, following a suggestion by Kai Engert, to have a little tool. You may know convergence, okay? So this is a setup of our tool. You have some user surfing, going to a server, and then back-checking with our notary server if she's seeing the correct certificate. The, our server does the check you get a report of the result and what happens. Okay, so far so good, and this is what, uh, where everything changes because uh, unlike convergence or perspectives, what we propose now to do is to trace route to the server. So Alice does a trace route across the man in the middle, reports the result to our crossbear tool, and this actually has a list of hunting tasks that you can pull from the server. So any user out there can pull this uh, hunting task list and uh, also do trace routes for us to the server. And the whole goal now is to uh, get a good estimate of where the man in the middle is sitting, in this case uh, in the left corner, and it's uh, usually a Wi-Fi access point in this case. But that's what we're interested really in. We want to collect data. Where is the man in the middle? What is he doing? That's what we do as uh, researchers. So Bob reports, we get results, and we evaluate all that stuff. I don't have much time to uh, go into details here, but of course the more users we have, the more accurate our traces will be. And our hope, for example, is can we distinguish if we have a, say, state-level attacker where the man in the middle is sitting on the uh, border router of the autonomous system, or do we have some weird hacker, a Mac, uh, black hat, who's sitting on the Wi-Fi access point of some hotel. That's what we propose to do. It's a young project. We have written most of it. First release will be mid-January, but we need bobs and bobinas to use it. Feel free to talk to me after the talk here. I'm, uh, I'll be sitting somewhere over there, and uh, you can access our website, find us on Twitter, or here. Well, that's all for me. Thanks. And actually, you've got two minutes and 50 seconds if you want to take questions, or are you good? Fair. Sure. Go. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, we have Herald Angels with microphones, so please just try to flag them down and we'll head over to you as quickly as possible. Again, because there are many more people watching this on the streams, they won't hear you unless you speak into a microphone, so please go ahead and, if you have a question, say it into the mic and find one of these guys, they'll come to you. Any questions? Oh, one down here. Can you? Can you only use data from people uh, that are sure that they are in, the, in a man in the middle attack, or can you use data from everyone? Uh, you can use it with any Firefox at the moment, whatever your situation is in. It has two, uh, two components. One is the guarding part, which is exactly like convergence. In fact, convergence is one of our back ends. Or you can use uh, the second component as well, where you pull the hunting tasks and work for us. So for, at the moment, it's only Firefox, manpower and all that. More questions? Okay, give him a huge round of applause for finishing it on time. Okay, up next we have iSniff SSL. Are you here? You're good? Okay. Uh, could we get the video angel to just make sure that Yeah, because uh, I just plugged in. I want to make sure that I'm working with the new cable. Uh, can you check the switcher box? Yeah. And who knows, this might just magically work. Are you sure it's set to the... We're using this extension cable. Oh, another thing, don't walk between the podium and the table. I, I think we had three pretty near fatal accidents yesterday. As long as nobody dies, it's all good. Yeah. Yes. 
Round of applause for whatever made that work. Are you ready to go? Those aren't my slides. Oh, crap. <laughs> and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure those are your slides. Uh, yep. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, my name is Hubert. Um, I work as a pen tester for a bank. Um, I'm here to talk about a little slide. I'm here to talk about a, a, a little tool I wrote, um, which performs a man-in-the-middle attack on iPhones. Slide. So um, this is about the CVE 2011-0228 vulnerability, which was announced in June or July. And uh, just a very brief intro to what the vulnerability is about. Um, so you have SSL certificates, SSL certificate chains. So here we have a, an example of a normal certificate for PayPal. It's issued by the VeriSign CA, uh, then there's an intermediate VeriSign certificate which is, has signed the PayPal certificate. Slide. Oh. Um. Okay, uh, ignore that. Uh, so so, so here's, here's another uh, example of a certificate for another website um, from Start.com, which is signed as a cert for another website. Slide. Um. Okay, so here's just, just looking at a, a small part of the certificate, which is the basic constraint, which, is the, which says, is this certificate a CA certificate or not? Uh, which is set to no. So any certificate you normally get from a CA will have that set to no. Slide. So normally, um, what we've done here is we've used a website certificate to sign a further certificate for PayPal.com, which is, of course, invalid. Um, which, and any normal browser will reject this, but the bug in the iPhone is the iPhone will accept this. Slide. So, uh, yeah, so this is the description of the, the patch uh, that Apple released, um, something about SSL validation slide. So um, I wanted to practically exploit this, and um, has anyone used Moxie Spikes SSL sniff? No? So SSL sniff is a tool written in C++ which does an SSL man in the middle attack. Um, it connects to the uh, target site, get downloads the certificate, generates a fake certificate, and presents that. So. I tried to use it, um, but it, it just didn't actually work with, with the iPhone. There was something wrong about the, SS, the uh, certificates that, I, that SSL sniff was generating, so I just decided to do it myself in Python. So the, the setup for that is just a Linux VM, a cheap uh, $8 USB stick, and um, Airbase NG, and DHCPD, and IP tables. Slide. So here's some the, the C++ code of SSL sniff, and after a lot of debugging, I found that the, the the thing with the set version three, that's what was making it not work. So I, I kind of got SSL sniff working, but it's C++ code, it's like thousands of lines, it's a lot of hassle to work with. Slide. <clears throat> so I just decided to do it myself in Python, so I used the M2 crypto module um, to uh, generate a new certificate on the fly. Um, slide. Ah, so I, actually this is the wrong version of the slides, never mind. Um, slide. So basically, um, yeah, this, 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 <clears throat> these aren't actually the right slides anyway. Um, so yeah, so you basically have a Python tool which um, uh, intercepts traffic. Slide. And um, actually, the if you, if you look at um, the iPhone 3G, uh, which was sold until 2009, uh, actually until last year, all, all these, these are iPhone sales. So uh, the, the iPhone 3G, which was sold until last year, um, the, the last supported software version for that is 421, and, uh, which is permanently vulnerable to this. So I think there's about 20 million iPhones around which will be permanently vulnerable to this bug. So yeah, so I think that there'll be exploitable phones for this out for a couple of years. Uh, slide. Yeah, so these are the resources. It's a little Python project on GitHub. Um, this is uh, some instructions for how to uh, set up the Wi-Fi connection with IP tables and Airbase. Uh, and these are the, the two advisories from the guys that found the original iPhone bug. Okay, thanks very much. Any, any questions? Uh, yeah, I... Did, was that an earlier version of the slides? Yeah, that wasn't actually the current version of the slides. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, if we have time at the end, we can maybe find the correct version. But yeah, you've got another 50 seconds for questions. 
Okay. Do we have any questions? Put up your hand over there. Get to you. So Apple seriously doesn't patch a vulnerability like that even in older iPhones? Yeah, so basically with, with the iPhone 3G, they just decided it's out of support now and uh, the, the, the last uh, supported software for that is 421 and uh, the, the, the vulnerability was patched in 435. So if you have a 3GS or newer, you can, you can patch, but if you have an iPhone 3G or older, there's no patch available. There is actually a patch available if you jailbreak the device. Someone has developed a, a jailbreak patch for it, but you could argue that makes your phone insecure in other ways. So. And that's your time. Give him a round of applause. Uh, Django is up next, and you have a live demo, I believe, right? Uh, no. Oh, oh, that's right. You're, yeah. I apologize. Anyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this. Yeah, I'm live. More on the screen. Huh? More on the screen. And then press space. Or oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, like back with your. So my name is Jeremias Kangas and I am self-employed software developer. I mostly make money with iPhone and Android apps, but in the last year I have been doing more and more Bitcoin related stuff just for interest and maybe I will start some business with it. Anyway, with a couple of friends we have done this library and its goal is to make moving Bitcoins around as easily as possible. So any, anyone can create a website which moves bitcoins around. And they, of course you can do like simple web shops, but you can also create marketplaces or anything like previously creating this kind of websites was pain in the ass because payment processing is not that easy and cheap. But with bitcoin it is and slide. There is some, I wrote down some example application you could like make money with. The idea is that you can, you can make really good money by enabling other people to make money, selling software or service or product which other people can use to make, earn money. So using the software, uh, the library is really easy. So it's Python and Django web framework. You just need a couple of functions and models to make a simple website. So next slide. And uh, so there are lots of features in this library and it's basically everything you need to start your own website. And finally, there is a small tutorial I wrote for the library. And if you want to learn the library, you can look at it and create your own website. So that's it. Any questions? All right, that's, that's it. We're time. Web WMD, are you up? Web WMD, are you in the room? Oh, Web FWD, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Okay, yep, give him another round of applause. That was, that was great. I love that. That's fine. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, there's only one problem. Yes. You're not going to be able to see it. Oh, shit. <laughs> so what will we do? Uh, do? Do you think that you could just direct me into pointing and clicking yes, in places? Okay. okay, yeah. But, but then... Yeah. Here. But did, 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 Use this. Did, but, ah. Use this and just point Ooh. and tell me where you want to go. Yeah, okay. Is this legal in Germany? <laughs> <laughs> Can we turn off the streams for just 15 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> at his eyes, we need him. 
I, actually, please point it at my eyes. I, I, I need to see. <laughs> okay. So it's the Web Forward from Mozilla Foundation. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, very good. Okay. So. Hi, my name is Joseph Shomoyi. I am going whoa, 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 about whoa, whoa. to talk about. Let's figure out how we're going to do this. <laughs> How did you want? How did you want to? Uh, should I play the video, or did you want me to play the video? No, no, no. no. I just show the link, and maybe you click on it. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Thanks. Okay. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Joseph Shomoji. I am talking about the Web Forward, which is the Mozilla's Open Innovation Program where people with open source uh, projects can get uh, world-class support from the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, or this is called Web Forward, which is the, comes from Mozilla Lab. So uh, check out their website, uh, their guidelines, and please go down here at the bottom, and there is a link. Okay, can you click on that? Thank you. So here, these are, these are their guidelines. Especially important is the manifesto. Oops, here. But yes, OK, if you want, you, you can click on it. And then, <laughs> yes, and then, uh, so basically, interoperability of web uh, protocols, uh, standards, uh, uh, open software, etc. This is the most important for the, them. So can you go back now? Yeah, and up. And there. Uh, if, uh, no, here, sorry, portfolio. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I would like to introduce a few uh, projects which were already approved. So this is an uh, open source uh, distance learning platform where uh, people can uh, text chat with each other, talk with each other, and video chat with each other, and also see lectures and presentations, and share uh, the desktop and files. Can you go down a little bit? Cash music. Here, uh, musicians can uh, collect uh, emails from fans, can show their upcoming tour, can sell tickets, can pull in social media and uh, um, filter the content of this social media. Can you go down? This is a, a photo sharing platform where you own uh, you retain full ownership of your photos wherever they were uploaded, Flickr, or wherever else. Can you go down? So here you can um, uh, 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 remix uh, modules of open source software. Here uh, bioengineers can create new living creatures by recombining their genetical code. And Vereza is a micropayment and microcredit uh, tracking tool. Can you go back up? Thank you. So now there about mentors. So if you uh, have an interesting open source uh, software, then a project, then you can get your world-class mentors, view this from every kind of professions. So they can help in many, many stages of your startup. Uh, among others, there are financiers and uh, uh, public relation, marketing, technology, whatever. Can Extend you time. Again? Oops. Okay. Up, up again. Up again. Yes. And there. Partners. Partners. <laughs> I 
Ah, yeah, yeah, here. So uh, Mozilla Foundation, or Web Forward, has also very interesting partners for cloud computing, for uh, project management tools, for uh, payment services, etc., etc. Thank you very much. Go up. So here you can apply with your project. Um, I can answer more questions if you ask me, but I am not a representative of Mozilla Foundation or Web Forward. Uh, one more question. Who has heard about this before? Please hands up. Okay. Nope, you are you you at your five minute mark. Thank you so much. I okay. All right, and hopefully the rest of the session we are on PDFs, I believe, except for the demos where I can actually probably go and find somewhere to take a shower. Uh, moon Mission, are you here? Moon Mission of the Nerds, part-time scientists. Nope, okay, um, good to go? I knew it was going to be a mistake bringing this thing out. <laughs> Howdy, I'm John Foy. Are you guys ready for some hardware? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, actually, would you feel more comfortable with the handheld? Can you manage two, two devices? Two devices. Double geeking. <laughs> Okay. Showtime. Okay. Yep. And then you know to, to call slide, right? Exactly. Okay. okay. Cool. And go. Hi, I'm John Foote. I'm a recovering scientist. Next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to talk about driving high power LEDs. Now, most of you have probably played around with the little LEDs, right? Anybody done that? Like down the hardware hacking section? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about these big honking LEDs. Next slide. Okay. So if you don't do the the uh, little LEDs, uh, and you hook it up to a voltage source, like a battery or something, you know you gotta put a resistor in there. Anybody tried it without a resistor? Yeah, what happens? <laughs> it blows the hell up, it's great fun, try it. Um, okay, so, um, next slide please. Okay, what do you do with these big honking resistors? Well, you can put a big ass resistor in there, but that may not be the best way to, to do things as the next slide shows, because this sucker will get hot, right? If you look at the numbers, remember power equals current times voltage. We got a lot of current, we got a lot of voltage drop across this, this sucker is gonna get hot. And even if it's only dissipating five watts, think about the size of that resistor. Think about a 100 watt light bulb, how hot does that get? How much smaller is that resistor than a 100 watt light bulb? So it's going to get smoking hot, and furthermore, you're wasting power. It's, it's inelegant. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is how you don't do it, okay? Um, people think, well, I can make a nice little uh, adjustable voltage supply, and I'll just dial in the voltage just perfectly so we'll get the right current through the um, LED. Um, no, next slide, please. Um, the reason why is because uh, the voltage... Um, current relationship for a diode is exponential. If you diddle around with little voltage, you're gonna get, might get huge current swings and that might be too much current to blow up the um, uh, LED. Next slide, please. Okay, so diodes want current and next slide, I'll show you a couple ways to get them. Okay, you can do a linear current source using a couple of these different things. These work great, however, these are basically smart resistors. They also get hot. Um, if you, um, uh, you can use a, a, a voltage regulator, put a big honking heat sink, it'll work great, but you might, once again, we're wasting power. Okay, so how do we do this right? Next slide, please, we'll show you. Okay, um, this is a SEPIC buck converter that stands for single-ended primary inducted converter. There's the inductor, right? It's that curly thing that you might have slept through in physics class. Um, okay, this is a resistor. Now, this is a tiny little resistor. It's less than an ohm, so it's not taking any power. Here's a switch. That's not taking any power. So any power that comes from the voltage source down to ground is hopefully going to go into that um, diode. And this kind of looks a little gnarly, but let me show you how it works. It's actually pretty easy on the next slide. Okay, so there's a switch here, and that switch can either be closed or open. When it's closed, the current comes from the power source down through the inductor, through the LED, and into ground, okay? And when it's open, it 
this, this diode kind of recirculates it. Now, inductors are kind of like flywheels for current. They keep, they like to keep a constant current going. They store energy in the magnetic field. Um, next, next slide, please. Okay, so this is how the thing works. There's a smart little chip that knows when to close and open the switch. This chip is looking at the current through the diode and you can measure that from the voltage across the sense resistor. If that voltage is too small, um, uh, that means the current's too small, so he closes that switch, charges up the inductor, gets more um, uh, current flowing, and when that gets too much current, he opens the switch, it recycles, and the current still goes through the LED. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is an actual circuit that I built. Um, this is that smart chip. This looks kind of gnarly, but now you know how it works, right? This is just a switch. Um, this is a sense resistor, and it's kind of monitoring the sense resistor, and it's either turning on or off that switch um, depending on feedback, and you can turn the whole thing on and off if you want to dim your LED using uh, pulse width modulation. Uh, next slide, and this is the money slide. There's no way you can possibly read that, uh, but um, this, is, uh, uh, this is the... Um, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, uh, this is the URL. This is a whole bunch of everybody wants to make these chips because everybody wants to replace the light bulb with these more efficient LED things. So there's a whole bunch of chips you can, you can buy that basically do the, that little tran tran transistor man thing. And that is pretty much the end of my uh, presentation. That's me. Thank you very much. This is going to stay in here for the rest of the lightning talks. Okay. All right. Um, do we have the free software song? Okay. You, you just got to make me one promise. Okay. Huh? Perhaps. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Whatever you do. Test, test. Okay, hold up. I still have to extract a promise from you. Please tell me first. Okay. Um, well, and actually, first of all, uh, could I borrow the mic back? Um, Cable, watch out. Check, check. Okay, just a couple of hints for using this microphone. Make sure that it's pointed directly at your mouth. Another thing that you want to try to avoid. Don't touch the antenna, because that, that, will, that will cause some problems with the noise. And it's really easy to... <laughs> it, it's also really easy during your presentation for the microphone to get further and further away from your mouth. So, so we'll, I'm, I'm going to use you as a guinea pig, because you're, you're singing, I'm assuming. Okay, so it's very important. Also, when you move, when you look at the camera, or when you go look at your slides, or when you rotate around and around <laughs> in a little dance. That, 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 um, that one's just for you guys. To make sure that the microphone stays pointed at your mouth. Also beware, the internet is watching you. <laughs> so don't turn your back on it. Okay, and that being said, I will let you know when to go. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not ready. Again, we're real professional here. <laughs> and one, two, three, go. Ahoy, I'm Marius Stüps from Hamburg. And I'm very sorry that so less opportunities are here to freely sing songs. I first thought to bring my guitar, but then I decided you all should see that singing without a guitar is also possible. It's not just uh, singing with a guitar. All, all the people always say, Oh, I can't sing, I don't have a guitar, but um, I think there's no problem, so slide. You see the first verse, and um, we're just gonna start to sing, you know, the free software song. <laughs> Join us now and share the software, you be free, hackers, you be free. Join us now and share the software slide. You be free, <laughs> hackers. You be free. Oh, 
Others can get piles of money, that is true, hackers like that is true, but they cannot help their neighbors, that's not good, hackers, that's not good. When we have enough free software at our call, hackers, at our call, we'll kick out those dirty licenses, evermore, hackers, evermore. Join us now and... Next slide. <laughs> Join us now and share the software. You be free, hackers. You be free. Join us now and share the software. You be free, hackers. You be free. Slide. Slide. <laughs> I didn't actually think that was going to happen. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> All right, null bytes reversed. Okay, cool. Hmm? Yeah, how about a round of applause both for that and for having to follow that? <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Oh, are, are you going to use the. Don't, don't, don't forget my advice. Right, point, point. You good? Yeah. Look, look, look at the screen. Okay. Look at the camera. Okay, good. give him a round of applause for that. That's pretty good. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'd like to talk a little about a little uh, glitch in the Java web application world um, about null bytes that if under certain circumstances, uh, if the weather is just right and the moon uh, is right, you might get command execution. Uh, next slide. So null bytes are by no means new, right? So this class of vulnerabilities has been around for a while ever since someone decided that it's a good idea to terminate strings uh, with a null byte in C. Um, so everyone probably has seen something like that where this is a PHP application where you try to uh, open a file and you give it a prefix and you give it an appendix and in the middle there is an attacker controlled string. So now what an attacker can do is he can get around the prefix, the images folder, but just uh, putting dot dot slash in front of the path that he specifies. Um, and to get rid of the dot jpeg at the end, it's a little bit harder, but he can use a null byte because when that string is passed on to uh, the underlying C library, the uh, string will get cut off at the null byte because C thinks uh, at null the string is terminated. Next slide. So wouldn't it be nice to have something like that for uploads as well? Um, this is a regular upload uh, request as your browser sends it when you upload a file. And as you can see, the file name is sent uh, in a content disposition header in the segment that is for the uploaded file. And that content disposition header has an attribute called file name. And that just carries the name of the file. Now, the naive approach slide um, would be to just use as in the URL a percent zero zero. Uh, to indicate the null byte. However, that doesn't work because the file name in there isn't, null to, uh, isn't URL encoded. So that percent zero zero will never be decoded and you will end up with a file that has the name pip.jsp percent zero zero dot jpeg, uh, which doesn't get you anywhere, right? Because you want the, ex uh, the extension of the file to be jsp to execute a code and not dot uh, jpeg. Um, now, another approach is to use, next slide please. 
um, to use a literal null byte. So historically, this never used to work because web servers were written in C, right? And when the web server receives this request, uh, it will just see that content disposition had a write until the .jsp. Um, and the web application framework is probably going to automatically correct that for you that the quote is open uh, and just send the string file.jsp onto the web application framework into your web application. So the application will see that the extension is actually .jsp, uh, .jsp and will not allow the file uh, to be stored. Now, as it turns out, nowadays actually there's a bunch of web servers that aren't written in C but that are written in Java. And for Java, a uh, null byte in a string is a perfectly valid character. So basically, what's going to happen if you upload something like that to, uh, say, Tomcat? Um, the Tomcat will just pass this request with the entire line, including the null byte, onto the web application framework. You're probably going to use something like Apache Commons file uploads. Uh, Apache uh, Commons file uploads is just going to put the entire string that is in the file name parameter into a class property uh, and will pass that on to the web application itself. Now if the web application doesn't take care, it will validate the string, will read everything after the last dot, which is .jpg. Extend time. Um, and we'll say, yes, that's a valid file, and write it to disk, but when it's actually written to disk, uh, it will end up having the JSP extension. Next slide. So what can you do about it? Never just store a file on disk with an attack-controlled file name. Just use an arbitrary file name that you chose yourself, because otherwise you might have collisions anyway if two people upload the same fi uh, a file with the same file name. And also, it's not a good idea at all to like serve files from your main domain where you have authentication cookies because you will be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Thank you. Uh, do you want to take one quick question with your next 23 seconds? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, repeat the question. What about oh, oh, yeah. Re repeat the question. What about the weather? Why does it not work sometimes? Well, sometimes if a web application doesn't allow file uploads or doesn't have the necessary functionality or isn't written in Java, it doesn't work. Oh, cool. Thank you. All right, li life hacking, are you here? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Okay. I, I actually, no. Take, take, take this one. Okay, and here's another example of why we run slides off of one laptop. Uh, previous times Lightning Talks has been run, we wasted a lot of time switching video and things like that. And in the rules on the wiki, it says that the time it takes you to set up your laptop, if you insist on doing a live demo, comes out of your time. So we're going to start the five minutes right now. Oh God, he totally got that one for free, didn't he? Go, go. Oh, um, can you can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> test test. Okay. My name is Thorsten Wismann, and I want to present you Herbs LuftVM, or you also can call it HLWM. So what is it? It is a manual tiling window manager for X11, and I started writing it in the end of July this year. So if if you say I have a new tiling window manager, then there are only two questions. The first one is how does the, the, does the tiling algorithm work? And the other one is how can I configure it? So the tiling algorithm is just a binary tree, a binary tree of frames. Initially, you have one large frame over your entire desktop, and then you can do exactly two things with it. You can either split the frame up into two subframes, or you can place some windows, for example, some terminals there. Okay, that's all. Then uh, the only way to configure it is by calling internal HLWM commands. There are two ways to call a command. 
The first one is to call it uh, with a client on the command line, or you also can bind keys to commands. So the command is executed if you press the key. And of course, you can bind these commands by calling the command for it. So this is rather abstract, but it's actually quite simple, as you can see in a quick demonstration. Here you can see you have one frame. Uh, I will switch the microphone. Okay. You, in, you initially have one frame, and now you can split the frame. You can have, now you have two frames, and you can split one frame again and place them clients there, like this. Or you can place a client in another frame, a terminal here, and you have a terminal, so you can call a client to execute some HLWM commands. These are the commands you can these are the commands you can execute, and for example, you can can call the command focus right, and then the and then the focus goes to the right. Yeah. And you also can say, give me the current layout. And then the, yeah, then the binary tree is printed. That's all. So as you can see, the control of the window manager is um, really keyboard oriented, oriented. And with this client, you have a good possibility to um, write scripts for it. So it's probably a good window manager for you if you say, I want to spend lots of time in configuring and scripting my window manager. <laughs> and it's not very good for you if you say, I, want, I only want to use the default configuration and the default configuration has to suit me. And it's also not very good for you if you uh, only want to use the mouse. So, because the, yeah, it's mainly keyboard driven. So if you say, hmm, I want to write some fancy scripts for my window manager, then try it out. You can get some information on the uh, homepage. You also can uh, pull the Git repository, join the IRC channel, or of course read the man page for it. Thanks. And you've got a minute for questions if you'd like it. Questions down front. What's it written in and how big is it? Um, it is written in C. It uh, uses glib and xlib. And currently, uh, there are 6,500 lines of code. Another question? No? Okay, thank you. And he followed directions by not walking between the table and the podium where I have many, many cables. Okay, so up next, now it appears that we have, unless I edit the article right now, um, also Moon Mission of the Nerds, did you ever show up? Mr. Slot, originally assigned slot, okay. Um, now we have life hacking. Life hacking, ready to go? Okay. Uh, no, I don't need video. It's just for timing. Oh, okay. Thank God. Because, <laughs> yeah, those last-minute notes I was going to do for myself, um, yeah, that's when the reporter showed up. So, okay. Yeah, another pro tip. Don't hit the microphone with your head. I could really use a microphone. Oh. Ask the presenter for the microphone if he hasn't given you one. Um, also, you may choose to use the podium microphone. If you think you're going to be um, moving around a lot or you think you might have problems holding the microphone, you can always ask for a mic check because these podium microphones will work 
and if the sound guy is following me here, the, the podium mics actually will pick up your voice from as far away as this. You just have to be sure, you know, if you move your head around a lot, you just have to be sure to check with the sound guy. That might be the better option for you. And if, well, okay, I guess I'm gonna have to keep it here now. Um, if you wanna do that. So it looks like, yeah, now we are back exactly on time. So, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Go. Okay, um, so I'm uh, going to show how I use bookkeeping, which sounds really, really, really boring. And I've used this a lot in the last few years, and I just want to show you how it can be cool and fun. Slide. Uh, so why am I doing this? My, my grandma told me to. This is actually true. Uh, my grandma said, boy, you should use bookkeeping to uh, keep ahead of your finances, and this is really useful. And there's also a lot of questions that will pop up in our lives every once in a while that we can comfortably and decisively answer with this. So like, uh, I had 100 euros a week ago, and where is this gone? Uh, how, how did it go away? And um, maybe you bought something that broke, and you want to know how old it was. Um, so you can check it and you can know how much you paid for it. So maybe you can do a calculation if you want to buy a new one or if you want to get it repaired. Um, actually, another thing that is useful is to keep track of how much you use on uh, bandwidth. Maybe you use your mobile phone a lot. Uh, you use mobile internet, so you may want to know which contract suits you. Um, and yeah, you can do comparisons of like the important things in life. How much do I spend on food? How much do I spend on hardware? And should I change this balance? Slide. So what I use is KMyMoney. This is just something I stumbled upon uh, a couple years ago when I started this. It's a very friendly looking nice client. These are not my figures. I do not own hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, but maybe I can get there in time. Slide. So uh, how do I do it? I just record all the transactions. This sounds really bad. Like if I buy a sandwich at a railway station while traveling, do I record that? Yes, I do. Um, I do it for all my accounts. I do it for cash accounts, which is just my bag of money. I do it for my checkings accounts and everything. The resolution I chose is a half a euro, which is convenient. And if there's any, you know, cents left over, uh, I just don't care. I put them in a cookie jar so I can roll them up into these little, you know, coin roll things. I really, really love that. Um, <laughs> You can do data validation by bank statements. So you go to your bank every once in a while and you get your statement. Uh, and you can cross-check that actually KMyMoney supports this uh, as a native operation to cross-check your stuff with the bank statement, which is really useful. Um, this does not take up a lot of my life. Um, I do five to 10 minutes every one to three days, depending on how much money I spend. And um, well, the data that is accumulated is currently 175 kilobytes of gzipped XML data. Um, and I've been doing this for five years, so that's actually okay. If you unzip it, you can see how it's uh, like two and a half megabytes of XML data. Yeah, slide please. So this is some data. I obfuscated this. This is not the real data. I uh, changed the numbers, of course, and this is Israeli shekels because I find the sign is really funny. Um, <laughs> But what we're getting into here is seeing how uh, correlations of this data with what happens in your life is interesting. Like uh, with these prominent dips, uh, I went on holidays, big and expensive holidays. And uh, yeah, you can see how things move. Uh, the, the light blue line is a moving three month, aver three month average. Uh, the violet line is a moving six month average. So that's just, you know, playing around with, I'm a, I'm a physicist, so I really love playing around with data and statistics and stuff. Slide. And um, yeah, as I said, you can uh, see live events. Uh, the red one is just miscellaneous entertainment, like going to shows and stuff. Uh, the yellow bars is uh, alcohol spendings, and the blue bars is cigarette spendings. So you can see how I quit smoking and how that helps. <laughs> and uh, you can see how my girlfriend broke up with me right here. <laughs> And, uh, well, yeah, this was one hell of a New Year's party, too. Uh, so, slide, please. Um, this is something for a more serious analysis. So, uh, how much am I using on uh, mobile phone contracts? You see how this is always a quarter of a year. So, you see, you know, five, five years gets to a lot of data. I'm not even going to, they love you, just go, you've got another minute. All right, minute. thank you. So uh, here it was a pretty expensive contract, and then I switched it, which means that I used a lot less uh, money on my mobile phone in the following months. This has to do with a girlfriend again. Um, 
but now I started using uh, mobile data. Uh, so there's some cost added, and I'm, I'm going to think, of course, I'm going to think about changing my contract so uh, I can get this down a bit. Slide. And now here's an important trick I want to show you in my last 30 seconds. Um, you are going to think that I cannot possibly track all my transactions. I'm going to forget stuff. And of course, yes, you do. And uh, what I do to uh, mitigate this is I just have a category called leakage. So I, I thought of all the transactions. I've tracked down like uh, 30 euros. And um, I'm just going to put five euros in I forgot this. Okay, so you have a category for your own failures and it's not too bad. Uh, you can just put it in this and it kept me going for five years. All right, just for those of you who haven't, um, who, oh, shoot. for those of you who may not have seen um, prior lightning talks, what we do to call time, and we might need a little bit of practice at this one, is when you have 10 seconds, I go like this, and then I start counting from down from 10, and then when I reach five, four, three, two, one, and okay. All right, that that was that was pretty weak. Um, yeah, let let's 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 do that one again. Um, also, Etherpad, are you here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, just. Okay, this is why I ask you to send me everything in PDF and review it ahead of time. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, do you realize that I receive 12 different presentation formats from people? Like, I don't like it, I don't like PDF either. No, 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 that's, that, that's fine, I, I got a... Hackers don't like to follow directions. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, I, I, I'd really rather not, if that's okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. Okay, you, use yours, but I'm taking it out of your time. You can always do the Jeopardy song, like do 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 do. We, uh, we could also bring back the free software song guy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And, and actually, if I would recommend just testing with the podium mic real quickly. That <laughs> might be better if you're going to be switching to the computer. Yeah. So can everybody hear me? Yeah, sounds good. OK, great. So uh, my talk is called Our Goal is to Make Collaborative Editing the Standard on the Web. I will talk uh, about Etherpad Lite. Like I said, my name is Peter Martischker. So I will start. So what is Etherpad Lite? Uh, what is Etherpad? So Etherpad is an open source software. Um, it's to allow people to write together in real time on the web. So if you have a friend, for example, in Australia, you can send him a link to a pad and you can write together and you can see while he's writing what he is writing. So everybody has their own color. And for example, here um, a small screenshot. Uh, uh, person one has blue and person two has red. So what can you do with Etherpad? So the most common use case is brainstorming. So for example, your manager sent a pad link to their um, employees and ask them, hey, you have any marketing ideas how we can do that? And every employee writes on this pad, and uh, how later the manager looks again on this pad, and there are lots of ideas, and everybody gets inspired of what the other people are writing. And this is much more efficient than if he would ask, um, send me emails, because you have everything copy-paste together. Uh, so, so this is one use case. Other thing is meeting minutes. So. Uh, if you have a uh, voice over IP conference, everybody can write its part of the meet minutes. You know that usually you have one person in here have to write all minutes even if you don't know about what he's writing. So you can solve that with a pad very easily. You can do translations. So for example, if you want to translate a complicated text, uh, you don't need one specialized translator. Uh, it's enough if you have 10 people that are able to translate a bit and they can correct each other. So this is also a very common use case. And on the German Pirate Party, we use it to write together on newsletter and press releases. And yeah, so these are the most common use cases. So Etherpad has two big problems. One problem is it's, like I said, admin's nightmare. So it has very high memory usage. It has memory leaks, so the longer you run it, the more memory it uses. It has very random high CPU usage, and it's very, very difficult to install. The other problem is it's also Coda's nightmare. It's written in three different programming languages on the server side. It's Java, Scala, and JavaScript, which runs on Rhino. Um, there's nearly no documentation. Um, and there are nearly no comments in the code. So it's very, very difficult to change it, even if it's open source. So open source is not everything. You also need documentation, too. Um, this is why I created Etherpad Lite. So Etherpad Lite basically takes some of the source from the original Etherpad and we ported it to Node.js, which is um, JavaScript on server side. <laughs> And so uh, this part uses much less memory. We went from two gigabyte to about 30 megabyte RAM. Uh, we have much less code from about 100,000 lines to 10,000 lines. Um, we optimized it to be easy embeddable. So the idea is that you have our, a web application and you want to embed Etherpad Lite as part of your web application. Um, so this is what our use case is, what we specialize it for. And it has nearly the same functions. So many people think it's called Etherpad Lite because it has less functions, but we call it Etherpad Lite because it um, uses less resources. So this is a very common mistake. Um, so yeah, basically that's it. Um, so. Please install it and give feedback. Tell me how you use it, why you use it. Uh, send pull requests. We have an IRC channel. And go to this URL. OK, cool. Thank you. OK. All right. Yeah. Uh, wait, what, what's your, what was it? Oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're after Hacker Fleet. I apologize, yeah. Okay, yeah, go, just go.
Uh, just use your laptop. The, the, the I cables already something. I thought you do. Huh? You asked me twice. Yeah, but the the the. Okay. Check check. Okay. Th this is a classic example. And you know, the first day went so well. Everything was just you know on. We were a little chaotic at the end, and then people started asking me to use Prezo and PowerPoint and Libra and blah, blah, blah. And now you're seeing why I ask you for PDF slides. You can just jump right one from the other, not interrupt the flow. And th see, th this is what happened because I, I have this problem. I have a really hard time saying no to people. Um, huh? What? <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> See, I, I'm very well rehearsed at these things. <laughs> hmm? Now I'm wondering which two people said that. Hmm? I, I'm not taking it away from your time because I still have to edit the rest of the schedule. All right, so everybody give Ian from Hackerfleet a round of applause, especially since we just made him really nervous. Mic Go. check, mic check. Hey, at least one thing works. Cool. Welcome. My name is. Can you. Oh, okay, give me that just, 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 yeah. Um, I like to stand okay. So, mic check. Yes, great. So, um, my name is Ian from the Hackerfleet, and uh, we do open source development. So, in the. Space, we have shitloads of objects, man made objects, thousands of them, measuring and observing and taking pictures and um, giving us information about our planet. But um, on the oceans, we have that, which is nothing, it sucks. So, what we need is something like that at the ocean, something that can do a lot more than just being at one position and measuring like a uh, speed and uh, some wind and temperature. So, we need something bigger, something better, and we need it open source. So, our vision is to form a community that develops autonomous naval robots uh, to develop our own autonomous sailboat dash satellite of the oceans uh, robot stuff, and uh, of course, hacker ships everywhere. So, how to achieve that? Um, we need to communicate better. There are far too less hackers that uh, do stuff for the oceans, on the oceans, or at the oceans, um, and we <clears throat> need to do more together. There are a lot of sailing enthusiasts um, all around this room, I'm pretty sure, but they don't work together. They, do, they go sailing and they come back and they go to these conferences, but we need to do more together. So we supply you all with communication infrastructures, with resources, with technical resources, even if you have a cool project with money. And if you have a cool project, please ask us. We will give you everything that, that we can give you to make it happen. So maybe you've heard of OpenStreetMap. Um, some people are trying to do something uh, like for the oceans, but uh, what there is already sucks because uh, no proper data acquisition is yet possible. There are two ways to do that. First thing is with the real ships, and um, that would be pretty easy. And second way would be with robots. We want to uh, do that both ways. So. This is our current project presented at the hardware hacking area currently right now, and I will be after the talk downstairs there to answer questions. Um, it's our workbench prototype. It is, it is not a final product. It will be an example for how to integrate our software and hardware platform into boats, and it will not be something to surveil other people. Um, this is a current bridge of a ship. You, you see shitloads of electronics are all there, but the problem is they all dump their data. They display it and they don't store anything. And even if they store, this data is not used for anything. But, but we could make the best map ever from that data that is on that bridges uh, from every ship in the world. So the only thing we need to do is develop software and hardware to acquire that data and make better maps from that. So to Former community, we're gonna do a sailing trip with uh, 
Uh, hopefully, a lot of you people will think of 50, 40, or 50 50 people in August, and the name of the journey is Cross Sea Scripting. I hope you will attend. It's in, from 9th August to 19th August in the Adriatic Sea, which is, at least from my point of view, the most beautiful sailing area on this planet. And after that, we're going to attend the conference. Nothing will happen, with it, which is directly at the harbor in Split, Croatia. So if you would like to do more hardware hacking, do more boat hacking, hack the seven seas, or just sail with us in August, please subscribe our mailing list, cross sea scripting at hackerfleet.org. And if you don't, know how, don't know how to do that, it's uh, explained there. If you have any questions, please tell me now. All right, he's got a minute for questions. Any questions on Hacker Fleet? Why is it blue? Uh, repeat the question, Ian. Why is it blue? Uh, it, it's a color. Any? Random? You, please. Um, are you involved with seasteading? With what? The seasteading movement in the United States and all over the world where we have a thing called ephemeral. It's like Burning Man for boats, and we're building floating cities and stuff. Uh, we, are in, we have exchanged some ideas, but there is no uh, constant communication going on, which we would like to change. So if you have any network, that, that would be great. Uh, just to clarify, Alex was talking about the Sea Steady movement. Any other questions? Raise your hand. Oh, I got flyers if you would like to have some, so ask me afterwards. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, while we're here, why don't we, why don't we practice the... Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay, you guys, you guys are doing so good right up until the buzzer. We can do better than this. Okay, you ready? Okay, let's do this. Five, can I get four, some? three, two, one. Yes, uh, that was much better. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Okay. Um, anybody knows how to get the the picture on my screen on the oh. yeah. microphone? Yeah. Move it over. It's a Debian. Yeah, yeah. And all the others. I hope you don't kill my session. Okay, uh, I really would like, so what I'm trying to show here is, um,
Okay, uh, I now have one and a half minute left, I guess. Uh, so I was thinking of uh, so, uh, showing, so I work in the European Parliament for the Greens and uh, I was thinking of making a live show, um, live amendment of one of the directives in the pipeline. So I've now, um, um, Citrix client running to my desktop here. No? Doesn't want to. No. No. I think I will have to take this later because uh, this is. is uh, I didn't count on, on this problem here with the screen management. So you just move me later. Sorry, Papa. Presentation, if you want to do it, can, can you can you run through it in three minutes and thirty-seven seconds? No. I was going to amend one of the directives that's now in in the pipe, pipeline uh, definition of piracy, so that you could show, see exactly the application that we use and how easy it is, and to get kind of a picture of, of um, what the people in the parliament are doing and, and how it's done. Um, there is a, I think, if you put the link on the, there's a, the application is called AT4EM. And uh, it, there is a demo. I don't know if you put the link to yeah, the yeah, demo. The, the links to all of the slides and any links you want me to put up will be on the wiki page afterwards. Yeah. Um, but I do ask permission before I do that, obviously. And I thought maybe I could ask the audience for proposals to amend this. Um, uh, uh, it's a directive on uh, enforcement of intellectual property rights, uh, customs, for, uh, cost, customs enforcement directive. So it's a kind of an ACTA 2 thing. Uh, so, but. Uh, can I show it later? Um, if there's an open slot, sure, if you can yeah, get it working. Good. Okay, all right. Give them a round of applause for the effort. And Grigor, uh, uh, Grigor, are you here? Gregor. Yep. Um, well, he's on, he was on the schedule next, actually. No, he's, he's right there. I was not just in time. Yes. Yes, and then after this presentation, we're going to take a break to give the Rocket Badge people a chance to set up their live demo. Stretching. Huh? Okay. <clears throat> Stretching break. Yes, stretch and bathroom break and setting up the Rocket Badge live demo, which actually arranged theirs in advance. Oh, my God. And had a very good reason for doing so, so give them a round of applause for getting that. Okay, so Gregor, go ahead, take it away, five minutes. Uh, my name is Gregor, I'm growing up here in Berlin since 76. My parents were on a Silk Road journey. In 1989, uh, 19, I was introduced into a, a therapy called HOMA therapy. And I had the idea uh, early in this beginning how our atmosphere uh, clean itself. It is like a pepper to a mobile at the shapes of day and night. In the center of day and night there are mass fluctuation of light that uh, give energy to the ground and all to the to the complete environment. Next slide please. <coughs> so we see that uh, this loop on the morning or in the uh, first wave is going to the ground and uh, pollute or give uh, energy and, and uh, healing or renewal to the earth. Next slide. Oh, uh, I'm going to pause you for a minute and give you a chance to do my check with that. So okay. what? what? Check one, one, two. Okay. Let's go ahead. Maybe it makes a bit simpler here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. So. Uh, air become polluted in the last one, uh, 200 years, mostly from the industrial uh, chemical and other stuff we created. 
And um, I'm talking about at least the somatherapy called Agniotra. It's an old ritual from the Vedas, from the Atava Veda, you may heard about. This uh, excerpt was made in 1947 by a guy called Sri Gajananan. So next slide, please. Uh, in the evening, we got the same way what we got also in the morning. The uh, complete, uh, or not complete, the um, uh, verbrauchte Energie, the, uh, hmm? the used energy comes into the higher atmospheres and uh, with the solar wind and the magnetic fields, it all changed over from north to south and south to north. And we got this phenomenon like weathers and whatever. And we got natural resources of this uh, weather. And we got uh, our industrial resources of uh, implicit uh, the weather. Uh, anyways, next slide. So we got this, uh, there is a little tripod or a, a pot uh, of copper uh, where we can like fire inside. Uh, at the sunrise and sundown. That's the basic fundamental Homa Agniotra. And uh, this Homa Agniotra, uh, you burn cow shit, clarified butter called ghee, and rice in the center, in the middle of uh, su sunrise and sundown. Next slide. Uh, so when you prepare yourself five minutes or ten, fin uh, ten minutes before the center of the wave is coming, uh, so next slide, the uh, fire has to burn and you put the rice inside and then something special happens. It makes the energy that is naturally there, already there and giving the uh, natural re renewal to the world, um, that uh, makes it double or more. I say like an anti-atom bomb and this fertilizes the atmosphere with the clarified butter that you burn and gives you a biological uh, field around the agriculture um, production or whatever you do. So next uh, slide. So you see, um, it's like there, there were measures like uh, it is like two kilometers radius with uh, polluting the atmosphere with this uh, clarified butter. Uh, it's like a fertilization of the atmosphere. Um, next slide. So at the daytime, you go your daily routine. It is only made for uh, 15 minutes Extend in the morning time. and 15 minutes in the evening. <laughs> next slide, please. So we have a difference between organic uh, conventional organic and homa. In the homa, we have uh, special structures, as you can see, uh, like a five a star. Uh, and the food is I, more I, tasty, I, tasteful, and everything is great. Uh, love, peace, and unity. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. All right, j just a quick word before the break. Uh, Guys, please, it's really, oh, thanks. It's really, really hard to get up and do some of these things. Um, and oftentimes people are running late. They just found out about it an hour beforehand. And you know, no matter how much you might not like the talk or zone out during it, it's gonna be over in less than five minutes. So show some fucking respect. Okay, anyway, so now Rocket Badge is coming up. We've got a 10 minute break. Uh, please be back here at 20 after 2. Thank you.
Hi, a short announcement during the break. If you are planning to participate in our massive multiplayer Pong game with your rocket, the last rows aren't the best. The receivers are here, and there are lots of free places in the front. So use the break and come up front if you want to play with your rocket in the multiplayer game. Do we have some spare rockets? <laughs> Okay, so enjoy the break and use the time to come front, up front if you want to play. Should we use the break for Q rocket Q&A, okay? Check, check. Okay, um, it is, I am very, very proud to introduce the Rocket Badge team that hacked the Lightning Talk format. So give them a round of applause for that. Okay. I never said you could not schedule three back-to-back -back demos that were thematically different enough to constitute their own lightning talks all at the same time. Plus, it's the rocket badge, so it's really, really awesome. So they have three, they have a five-minute talk and then two demos, was that it? Okay, so they have a five-minute talk and two demos, and they're taking up the next 15 minutes. Give the rocket badge team a huge round of applause. They're going to take it from here. Hi. Um, okay, this is about the uh, uh, multiplayer, uh, massive multiplayer pong. Uh, we uh, um, wanted to have a, a nice game with uh, uh, playable with the rockets by a bigger audience. And basically, uh, if you have a rocket, uh, you can log in into the game, and you have the option to control the right or the left side. And it's basically averaged uh, from all your inputs, and you have to. Uh, you can play a little bit in the background. Uh, uh, the, the, the setup is basically done uh, currently with two of the tracker readers you see around which do track all your movement if you enabled it on your rocket. But you can actually use, uh, you can actually use uh, a rocket as a receiver also. The, the, the code for this is all in our Git. Uh, <laughs> And <laughs> oh. I, uh, the, the numbers in the, in the bottom right should be the number of players, but actually it looks like it's broken. <laughs> That's what, what happens if you do some last minute changes. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, you can check out all the code. The Pong is implemented in JavaScript uh, using WebSockets to connect to uh, the game script, which is written in Python. Uh, there's uh, the compute, complete Python lib for controlling games. Uh, down in the hack centers, there is a four, five-player Tetris. Uh, 
Six? Oh, sorry. Six player Tetris uh, implemented with the Python Game Lab and Rockets. Oh. 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 Okay. Sec is shortly trying to fix a thing with the number of locked in people because I think it's pretty interesting to see how many people are controlling the pedals. I'll use the meantime and tell something about the setup for people who want to redo it themselves. What, you, what we're basically using, using here is the, the open beacon readers uh, for inputting your movement, but that is not, not necessary. You can also use a rocket with a bridge code firmware. Does it work right off the box, Sec, or do you have to change something? Okay. Okay, so it should, it should basically easily work with rockets as a receiver part, but not in the version which is currently committed. SEC will commit the needed changes today or something like that. So if you want to, to uh, do it on your own notebook, you need a rocket as a receiver. And, oh, and you also need to announce rockets, right? No? Yes. You don't? We don't know what we need. Sorry. <laughs> we need? Well, the uh, Open Beacon readers are configured to only receive packets, and we have distributed at least three rockets in the room here, which announce the game. And um, but if you're using a rocket to play the game, you, it um, it switches the channel, announces the game, switches back uh, to another channel, um, reads packets, and once a second switches back and announces the game. So you only need a, one single rocket to play the whole game um, as a server. Yeah, but um, we are using a little bit more elaborate setup here. So, oh, okay, 20 people on the left side, 35 people on the right side. Okay, do you want to say something about how the averaging works or what our ideas for the algorithm were, Sec? Like? During the talk, we already tried this. Uh, it turned out where well, people had problems reaching the complete top and the complete bottom because everyone needs to control the record. So in this version, I uh, implemented some kind of idle timeout. If you take part of the game, uh, but don't use the rocket control for like 40 seconds, you will get thrown out of the game. So you have better chance of reaching uh, the extreme positions to hit the ball. Uh, that, that was only one of the ideas. The other idea was, no, oh, okay. The other idea was to, to allow oversteering, so basically scale it up a little bit to make it easier to reach the top, but I think this idea is the better one. Extend time. Any, any, any questions about the setup? Or do you just want to play? <laughs> yes? Uh, I'd like to know about the averaging. Why do you average the position and not the movement? You, you could also say if uh, a majority of, of people steer up, the um, uh, thing goes up. <laughs> Paddle. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that what was more interesting that way. Uh, one, one thing is you could reach more easily uh, the, the uh, position because it could move quicker if everyone decides to switch. And the second thing is, uh, it was to show that uh, some kind of swarm intelligence. Uh, there's no, no correct answer to move the paddle, uh, but the people automatically decide wi what to choose to hit the correct spot. Thank you. So, welcome to our new talk. Moving the pedals, it's a live demo. So we will shortly set up, oh, it's already running. Sec is really fast, set up the game here. Why are the numbers back to zero, Sec? You don't know. Uh, because it's the second talk, of course, we had to reset it. That's the rules of lightning talks, it's very, very hard. Nick is really strict there. So we had to, re we had to restart the software and now nothing is working anymore. So, so what's that? Ignored all the players now. What is? It moved all the players to the ignore list. Oh, happy! 
happy restarting. I, I uh, try to continue what you were what you were trying to what you were trying to explain about the the movement of the pedal. Uh, the idea is, that you, if you press up and down, there is no no way to uh, get, get, give an exact position from zero to some arbitrary value. So the swarm intelligence has to randomly decide, do I press up or down? If everybody would press up because the pedal has to go up, the pedal would instantly be at the top of the screen. So it's a bit of a, a delay of people, oh, should I go up, should I know? And the more they go up, the higher the, the pedal goes. But not everybody is allowed to do the right decision. So this really is a funny experiment, and we were quite surprised that it actually worked in a way. What we would like to try, if Zach has the game running back. I, I fell over the power cable. <laughs> he fell over the power cable. So if, if the thing is back working again, we would try to possibly increase the speed of the ball and see how fast the swarm intelligence, or it, it should increase automatically, shouldn't it, Zach? Yeah. I think we even set it to, to after every lost ball to increase the speed, so we can see how fast the swarm intelligent pedal movement <laughs> can really get a pedal to a specified position, because in theory, the audience could instantly move the pedal to any position if they just do the right decision in how many people press up or down. So what your basic algorithm in your brain should be Choose a random number between zero and the value you want to go, <laughs> and decide upon that if you have to press. But of course, that will not. It's getting faster. Oh, I think he's repowering the recipients. That looks almost like we're not at hacker jeopardy here. You can use, <laughs> you can use working technology. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think it would be better if it would move. We have left players. That's unfair, Zach. Only one. <laughs> I, I think this is a little, a little unfair because of the left side. Ah, uh... oh, OK. Possibly a few more people should. Where are your rockets? Please join the, <laughs> join the forces of the left side. It's very unfair. Are oh, we getting higher? OK, so now the speed of the ball should increase with time, right? Ah, oh, okay, it's increasing even more now. Are there any questions in the meantime while you are playing here? There's one far in the back. Can the microphone go far in the back, please? Hi, uh, we'd like to get the logs of people's votes. Is that possible? Do you log the, the, the votes from the badges? Uh, we're, we're running at full uh, TCP dump on the, on the packet, so we Excellent. have a complete log. Good stuff. Thanks very much. And I think we can, we can publish it later if you want to, to analyze how such things work. So we put such dumps anywhere where you can get it. I think it's getting faster now. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I think you should restart it. <laughs> you have to rejoin the game, I guess. One minute. <laughs> One minute? Okay, we have to get close to an end. Are there any last minute questions for this talk before we start the next one? Where are my slides? These, these are our slides. They're in the background of the Pong, and I think we used all of them. No, this was yesterday, <laughs> I think. <laughs> okay, now remember the speed is increasing again, so get the... Ten, Why are there 47 and 21? So thanks for all your help. Okay, so welcome to our third talk. <laughs> and we need more players here. And it's still getting very fast. Yes, you should remove the increase a little bit, I think, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> <Everyone>. <laughs> 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 
They actually got one. That's not that difficult. I, why did the... Oh, it starts always in this direction, so it's really unfair. You should alternate that sex. It's very unfair. It wasn't random, it was all going to that one side. Yeah, it's going to the side who won. Yeah, that's not random sex. Going to the side who won is not random. Why are 43 players not able to move a pedal to a specified <laughs> position? What am I playing? I'm playing left, okay. Up. Everybody has to play up, press up to get to the real, to the real limit. Yes, everybody has. Sector didn't change it. So we really have to, we have to agree on the, the top level. Uh, does anybody still have questions about the setup you need? Uh, the, the code is basically in the Git repository. So if you go to the, the Rocket website and check out the Git repository, you should, where do you find it? It's in, in our standard uh, Rocket Git. It's on GitHub and uh, the repository is called Rocket with, with a zero and no C. If it's a consensus, oh, can uh, we ban somebody? <laughs> Sorry? If it's a consensus, can we ban somebody? <laughs> no, currently not. Uh, the, the, the code is in uh, the tools game uh, bong. It's like pong but with a B. Oh, okay, that's actually not scope of this talk, but... Uh, it's uh, how... Uh, sorry? Uh, how, how does the mesh network work and how does tracking work? That's not really part of uh, this demo, but uh, uh, every rocket just uh, for tracking just broadcasts its uh, current ID uh, and there are several readers uh, several readers around the convention center, and uh, they they listen, and uh, we're trying to. There's there's a more or less clever script trying to uh, deduce your position if you're seen by more than one readers, because it's sending in different uh, transmission strengths. So if you only see the packets which are sent very well, with very high uh, power, uh, you're far away. Uh, and uh, it also sends uh, uh, the, your nickname, which you configured on your rocket. And there's actually, uh, since yesterday, a working JSON, uh, uh, which contains all the data. And there will also be a packet capture file of all the transmitted data. Uh, and as to the mesh network, that's just simply flood fill. Each badge retransmits the packet it sees if it's uh, within its current parameters. Okay, to, to, to make that clear, the mesh... <laughs> you have to restart again, I think. Uh, to make that clear, the, the mesh network has nothing to do with either the tracking or with this. This is direct transmissions from your batch to our receivers here, and that's basically the same what the tracking does. This is the same receivers, and your batch is sending on a different channel your nickname and your ID. And the mesh network is completely different and is broadcasting the time from batch to batch. And you find the URL for the tracking on the Twitter account. Thank you. Um, just so that you guys know, all links provided by presenters, including slides if they give permission, will be posted in the wiki article, Lightning Talks, where the schedule was. Um, and then as soon as, um, as soon as Lightning Talks are over, give me a couple of days after the Congress, I will post all of the content to the wiki, which will be archived um, a couple of weeks after the Congress ends. So guys, give the Rocket Badge guys a huge round of applause. <laughs> Is the OK Rocket team here? OK Rocket? OK, great. Just give me a little quick second to set up again here. I use the time for a last announcement to all Pong fans out there. Yesterday, someone brought us a loadable to play Pong Rocket versus Rocket directly with the wireless. So this is, will be linked in a few minutes on the wiki. You need two rockets, and you can play Pong wirelessly against each other. Thanks. <laughs>
and then introduce yourselves really quickly. Uh, okay, this is uh, Torp, and it's. Oh, no. um, yeah, just uh, I'll bring up the slides, but just do your intro while I bring them up. Check, check. And then I, this was a very, very last minute submission, but I thought, you know, why not have four talks of rocket content? You guys like that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so without any further ado, we're going to just a quick review of the format. Um, every presenter has four minutes at the one minute mark, I, or at when those four minutes are up, I ask for extend time, and that's when you guys applaud if you like it. <laughs> applaud if you like it. And then if you don't like it, you can stay silent. And that means they're over. Um, and then for advancing slides, presenters don't forget to call slides. And just a quick review of mic position. If you're using the podium mic, you don't, you don't have to eat the podium mic. You can stand back here, and they will hear you just fine. So do a quick mic check for both of you on the podium. Yeah, that seems it works. Good morning. <laughs> nope, nope. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. okay, yeah, so just be sure that the audience can hear you. They'll, they'll give you visual feedback if they can't. So without any further ado, we have five minutes, got five minutes on the clock, and go. Uh, okay, this is Torp, I'm Book. Uh, we uh, make some shameless advertisement for uh, a new rocket application, since all you have your rockets with you. Uh, I guess we build a dating app for the rocket. And um, slide, please. <laughs> This is, of course, uh, very important because uh, dating seems to be a hard problem and uh, it involves uh, some awkward social situations. You need to get close to people, physical proximity, and uh, talk to them. And maybe in the end they don't share your views on cannibalism or anything. So, uh, uh, so, so it, it's good to know before. And, uh, of course, as all social problems, they have a technical solution. And uh, this technical solution is our application. Um, slide, please. There is a dating site in the wiki. The dating site is not very well populated. There is uh, four categories, or five categories, for human dating, and uh, this there's three entries in there in total, so that's more categories than uh, actual entries, and uh, we want to uh, uh, get this up. Is so, there a section for carbon dating? Repeat the question. Uh, is, is there a, a section for carbon dating? Carbon dating, like uh, every life form based on carbon. <laughs> oh, uh, I didn't get it, sorry. Um, okay, so, so we have this great new application, and uh, you can uh, check it out. Uh, slide, please. On, on our website, download it now and uh, put it on your rocket. And uh, in the meantime, Tobias will explain to you how it works. So the basic idea of OK Rocket is um, you create a profile of your preferences, and this profile is broadcasted to other users who also have this application running. So it's very simple. You go to this website, you download the, the code file. If you don't trust us, download the C file and compile it yourself and um, put it on your rocket by just copying it using must, USB mass storage mode. And then you're asked to fill out a small profile consisting of 14 binary questions. So like, what chromosomes do you have? What chromosomes would you like your partner to have? If you like, we have we are your emacs, dogs or cats, uh, <laughs> and so on. Um, so this creates a small bit string that is just broadcast to your uh, vicinity along with the nicknames of other people having uh, the application running and then you instantly see a list of people and how much their profile matches yours. And if there's someone whose profile has a more than 80% match with yours, then the red LED starts blinking. So you should have a look around and see if there's any other people who have uh, the red LED blinking, and then you should go talk to them. So. <laughs> who's yeah. Lemming? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so this is the... The, the camp the, rocket and yeah. the current rocket have uh, another position for the red LED. So you should um, say it's the down left. Uh, okay, so this is... The, the bottom left LED is the, the red one on the 28C3 badge and on the camp badge it's... Green. It's, it, it, it's green, yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah. Um, download the app. Ah, uh, by the way, next slide. <laughs> We actually did a field test, and it works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, this couple wasn't made, uh, wasn't made with the application, but they uh, were asked to, uh, to install it on their rocket, and they uh, completed their profiles, and indeed the red LED started blinking for them, so <laughs> that uh, confirmed that our questions work, or that, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> <One sample. laughs> so yeah, uh, super yeah. sufficient. Yeah, so 4K, create your own versions of it, uh, download it, play with it, uh, and hopefully find people who you like and who like you. Our network has currently <laughs> two players. Extend time. <laughs> <laughs> Extend time. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. We've got one minute. One minute. Uh, any questions or go for a field test, maybe? <laughs> You can easily extend uh, the questions, so you can set up uh, other things uh, from dating. So uh, one person yesterday suggested to us that we should make a, a flame war version of it, so you can go around and your flame starts blinking as soon as it finds someone with a different view on the favorite editor. <laughs> <laughs> So that's very easy. Uh, send us pull requests or something and uh, we get uh, out more versions. Okay, Arver, Distributed Lux Management. Are you here? Cool. And go. Okay, hi, um, we're from a community ISP and uh, we want to present you uh, our solution for, uh, it's a tool we wrote, it's called Arver, and uh, we wrote it to manage uh, hard disk encryption keys. Uh, next slide. So you pro well, probably a lot of you know the problem. You have like a, a server with an encrypted hard disk and you have a lot of uh, admins that need to access this hard disk. So uh, next slide. So what you do, you share a password. Well, we can do better, I think. Uh, next slide. <laughs> then uh, there's another problem. You don't just have one server. You have a, a whole bunch of servers and uh, you need to have access to all of them. So you need to know like uh, several passwords. And uh, next slide. Um, you need to type all those passwords. For example, consider you have a power outage and you have to type in like for half an hour password, so that's not really a convenient solution. Uh, next slide. So uh, we thought, well, we can do better and we uh, wrote a tool to address those problems and uh, I want to start with a wish list uh, that captures what we want this tool to fulfill. Next slide. Yeah, so we have uh, mainly two things first. That, that's the per admin policy. So we like to be able to say that a certain amount of admins have access to this and that disk and uh, another subset of admins have um, access to all the disk and one admin has access to only one disk. And we also like to um, ease the, dis uh, the key distribution. Next slide. So for, um, for the different kind of accesses, we um, kind of map a user to a lock slot. So Lux has um, eight key slots, and you just define which user is in which slot, and then we can set the access like that. Next slide. So um, if Alice wants to add um, access for Bobs, um, she types um, Arver add user Bob and the disk, and then Arver will add and um, will generate a new key. Next slide. Uh, will generate the random locks key and um, put that um, key into Bob's slot. Next slide. Further, it will take the random locks key and encrypt uh, it with Bob's um, GPG public key 
and then we have an encrypted um, LUX random key which we can hand over to Bob. Next slide. Um, we can hand over this key distribution via mail, we can um, put it in a Git repository, push it and tell Bob to pull it. Next slide. And then Bob can actually just type in, I want to open that disk and if the disk was closed, um, next slide. Um, it will take the encrypted file, decrypt it with the private key, um, send the key to the slot and open the disk. Next slide. Uh, so there are two more items on our checklist. Uh, we want to do automation, so next slide. I have here uh, two examples of commands you can execute with Arbor. So in the first example you show that Arbor groups your disks by server and by location and you can just uh, apply commands to, to a whole bunch of disks by just saying I want to apply it to the whole server. And you also have script hooks uh, where you can define what kind of scripts get executed after, uh, after a certain action is performed. So uh, you might imagine in the first command that uh, there would be a post open hook that just starts all the V servers after uh, all the disks are opened and that works all automatically. Uh, then another very handy use case for automation is uh, if, if you consider that for example, you don't trust Eve anymore, you want to remove her from all the disks you have, so that should be also something that should happen really fast. Extend time. <laughs> okay, next slide. Then uh, another item on our checklist is deniability. So uh, we want to provide at least some form of deniability and this is achieved by storing the, all the metadata that we have about the key also in the, in the encrypted format. So uh, uh, when you look at the, at the Arbor key, you don't know uh, for which server there is a key in it and you don't even know how many keys are in it because we apply random padding to the, to the keys. So you can always deny that you're even on the, that you can even access a disk. Next slide. That's the future, future work that we want to do. And uh, next slide. Yeah, I hope you're done. It's just the URLs. Yeah, it's the URLs. What? The URLs. URLs. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, Project Memopole, are you here? Project Memopole? Okay, unhosted. Oh, wait. Unhosted or Memopole? Oh, Memopole? Okay. Okay, Memopole. Quick mic check. Hello. Uh, are both of you presenting? Yeah. Hello. And go. Uh, my name is Timo, and uh, we would like to show you a project called Memopol. Uh, let's talk about back background first, and then uh, let's see how the machine works. Next slide, please. Mm, we come from Estonia, and Estonia is a little uh, country in Northeast Europe. And uh, we have uh, developed a lot of uh, governmental IT uh, applications. And uh, this uh, installation is about them. And Mo uh, will talk about uh, these uh, government IT applications. Next. Next slide. So this is our national ID card that uh, we have had over 10 years now. Uh, in essence, it's a smart card that uh, has some encryption keys that are signed by the National Government Certificate Agency. So it enables authentication and digital signing. The next slide, please. So over the years, our government agencies have set up different databases, collecting information needed for the operation. For example, driver licenses, different kind of permits, income tax, etc. So to en enable this, uh, cross-communication between these databases. There was this framework called XT or XROAD that established that uh, provides this backbone of uh, services and the information movement between. But uh, this uh, network is really closed down. It's really hard to get uh, a normal citizen to uh, get access to, to these uh, services. Next slide, please. So, uh, as a means for an ordinary citizen to access these databases and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, services, a web portal called HDA or Estonia.e uh, was established. It tries to be a central place through which all citizen state communication could go. And after authenticating with your ID card, you, you can have op access to the all information that the government has on you in different databases. Even though the government has tried to promote this portal, it's relatively unknown in the common public. Uh, most people still don't have a clue what information the government has about them, and they don't know that they have a way and the right to access this information. Next slide, please. Uh, so in 2010, there was a need to reflect on these fast developments, and the idea of Memopol came alive. The concept was to turn around the positive image of e-government and present the same data seen in government portal from another perspective. Uh, when the government portal uses nice, green, happy and friendly aesthetics, Memopol was meant to be the opposite, big, scary, noisy and evil. The machine has a smart card reader and a pin pad. When the user inserts his uh, personal document to the machine and enters pin code, it starts collecting data from the databases through government portal and also from other sites like Google and Facebook. After collect collecting the data, it's analyzed and computed into animation. Next slide, please. Mm, this is the second version of the machine. And this also included a scanner for international passports and other ID cards. Uh, with them, the level of data is of course smaller as it uh, can access only public information, but it's, uh, it, it still enables to generate the kind of uh, information sphere about the person. You can see the machine in action on the website. Uh, just talking about privacy might seem abstract to regular public, but providing the way to experience the invasion of it personally might alter some views. Next slide, please. Extend time. Uh, here are some examples of data presented on the screen. It displays medical prescription drugs for, from health uh, system. You can see your high school exams in the center. Uh, there is a tax uh, database that you can calculate uh, incomes and Facebook and Google widgets. Mm, next slide, please. So in uh, next year, there will be a uh, Memopol 3 in Germany and the plan is to include German ID card in the system as well. So uh, uh, to uh, access this, uh, this card, uh, we need the local knowledge. So if there are some people who have been doing some things with it, it would be nice to meet you and maybe talk about it. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, unhosted, are you up? And food hacking base is on deck right after this. What's up? Yeah, you can hear me, right? Yep. Uh, okay. Just try to maintain a consistent position by the microphone so the sound yeah. guy doesn't have to keep adjusting. Okay. Okay, ready and go. Right, so uh, I'm Jan. I'm the design dictator for the Unhosted project, and uh, we love the web, and we want to help you achieve freedom from the web's monopolies. And um, yeah, next slide, please. I'm going to tell you a quick thing about software evolution. Next slide. So basically, uh, software, or what we, what we do all the time, is we have apps on the top, and we have data on the bottom, like your data. Next, which might be your documents and photos. Next slide. Next slide. And there are multiple applications, so whatever, your word processor, your um, photo editor, next slide please. And yeah, that's all on the desktop. So you have your home folder, your My Documents, and um, all the different apps, and um, you have your data where you know they are. Um, next slide please. But yeah, that was on the desktop, next slide. Uh, now, on the web, there basically you have all these package deals of apps and storage. So you have your Google Docs, you have your Facebook, you have your Flickr, and you need to get accounts at each one. You need to put your data there, you give your data away, you license it away, and um, it's a hassle to uh, keep track of all of this. Um, next, please. 
So yeah, and it's it's hosted, so you you don't even know any anymore where it is. So it's it's not even on your computer anymore. Uh, next, mostly in California. Next. Um, so what we want to do is enable you to to have the um, yeah the the good parts of the web. Next. Um, yeah. But, but with, the, with, the, with the good parts of your devices as well. So next, all your, next, um, all your devices, which essentially boils down to having a browser where you can access these from. Next. Right, so we propose a better architecture, next, for the web, next, in which we <laughs> separate web apps from data storage. So say so you have your, your, um, your web apps, your um, uh, photo editor, your uh, document editor, and, but your data is, is in one place, your home folder for the web, which might be whatever, your CouchDB instance, um, your own cloud, might be even your Dropbox, um, if we get that legacy support running. But basically, next, you go to an application in your browser, then you authenticate with your, um, or you, you uh, via a web finger call, you get to the remote storage, next. That gets loaded in and basically synced all the time while you work on it, next, and gets synced back, and if you leave it, then, um, it's, it's vanishing again, so you can use it on your friend's computer or on the internet cafe. Next. Uh, next. So we call that protocol what we do, or basically all we do is a one page specification for an open protocol we call remote storage. So it's similar to local storage in the browser, um, but remote, so you can use it not only locally, but it basically syncs your local storage to this um, uh, remote storage that you have. Uh, next. So, yeah, the technology we use is basically we say um, free software on the web or free, free hosted software for the web is not the solution because it's still hosted on the server that you can't control. So we say JavaScript is awesome because it's always on your client. It always runs on your computer. So the apps are pure JavaScript, next. Uh, they do a web finger call, next, to the storage, and they authenticate via, uh, either via OAuth, next, or we do the sign-in via browser ID, which is developed by Mozilla and is really, really good, which wants to take sign-in basically from now, from the operating system, the user management, from the operating system to the browser, which is great. Next. And cross-origin resource sharing, which is basically, which basically allows the JavaScript app to make cross-origin, cross-domain Ajax calls um, to access the data from the remote storage. Next. Extend time. Thanks, yeah, and get put delete for syncing data, uh, next. And uh, we work on making storage providers compatible like OwnCloud, CouchDB, and eventually Google Drive and uh, WordPress and Dropbox, next. Uh, yeah, that's me on the left, uh, that's Mikhail on the right, he's our code communist, and in the middle it's uh, Kenny who had the original idea, and we are in a small town called Unhost, which is basically our name, uh, uh, excuse me? Uh, there's a question from the chat. Oh, yeah. Will this make the application a lot slower? Um, if, if you're a good coder, no. <laughs> Why should I know? It depends on how good you can code JavaScript. So um, yeah, and uh, next slide. Uh, we're sponsored by uh, your donations and the NLNet Foundation, which is the Dutch Foundation. Next. We also do awesome projects with Terms of Service, didn't read, which is for rating Terms of Service. Next. Then Libre Projects with lists, lists free software web projects. Next. And open tabs, which is decentralized transactions. Next. No, nope, no, nope, you're done. The, the address is there. Yeah, okay. we are unhosted everywhere, and thanks. Okay. Thank you. A uh, quick mic check. Yeah, sure. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go. Hello. So, may I? Yeah, go. Perfect. Okay, so hi to everyone. Uh, I'm glad to hear to see a full hall. It's not because of me, I guess, but still it's nice. Uh, uh, my name is František Apfelbeck. You may know me already from the CCC camp and from the last conference where I had also short lightning talk. I am now in the head of the Food Hacking Base, uh, which is a small project which you could see in the camp for the first time, where it was a part of the Hackers on a Plan uh, under Nick Farr. 
Uh, we basically come together uh, doing different workshops, uh, presentations. We were doing uh, various food hacking, of course, because that's what we like. And uh, in this, let's say, year, from what I started, let's say, this project, we did uh, also a hacker tour, in my case, and today, and the last three days, we did several uh, events here in the 28C3. Next slide. Yeah, oh, sorry, could you, back? Yeah, so, uh, this one, sorry, I will just, you know, have to orient a little bit. Uh, the first thing which I did, inspired by 20C3, uh, and through the contacts which I got here, was a hacking tour around Europe. I went first to Progress Bar, where we had a really great party. Uh, it was open uh, Progress Bar party in Slovak Republic. After I popped in a battle lab, uh, I went to Seabase, Hamburg, I went to Holland. It was really great. I did also workshops and uh, met people who I met already here. So it was nice kind of, you know, uh, come together again. Uh, next play, thing which I did uh, was uh, joining 091 Labs in Ireland. Uh, it's a really great I think, space in Galway. Uh, we found that there a nice group called 091 Brewers. Next slide, please. Uh, where we did, a lot, we did a lot of brewing. I did some non-alcoholic brewings, but as you can see on the Irish and French faces on the photos, the alcoholic uh, experiments were uh, more in favor, I would say. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are playing again with experiment incubator, improving a bit, you know, the design, but I have to say that we didn't get so far uh, compared to our drinking experiments. Uh, a big event of this year, where I guess many of you uh, were, was CCC Camp. It was a great event. Uh, I'm really glad that I was there and uh, it was five days of madness, I would say, in its peak. But <laughs> yes, the experience was really amazing. Uh, we did loads of sushi workshops, you know, in the Indonesian cuisine, you know. Uh, there come people from Russia doing uh, quest workshops. Uh, we did parties under the Polish uh, uh, hackerspace who came. I have to say that uh, I'm really looking forward for the next one. And I hope you come and uh, we will have more fun brewing and experimenting. Next one. Uh, resulting also in our present, you know, not just on 28C3, I hope in 29C3 and 30, etc. Uh, this year uh, we came here and we did things just based on donations, open source, so means who would like to do something just came, we got the things together and we did some prowling workshop, again some sushi, kvass, uh, we have now just starting a cheese uh, tasting downstairs from a guy, Francois, who came from France. So if you like Roquefort, etc., you can pop in. And you can do basically what you like. Uh, come to us, talk to us. Uh, we Extend can come. Time. Thank you. And we can come together somewhere around. Uh, my next big plan for this year, 2012, is to move to Japan, where I would like to study more of the fermentation in the Japanese way, which I think are amazing. And I hope that uh, I will be able to share the knowledge which I get there and elsewhere with more of you. Uh, there are lots of people doing uh, food hacking or however you like to call it, like DIY bio, which do a lot of biotechnologies, uh, brewers, of course. I think this part is really important of society, or really important part of the society, of the hacker scene. And I see it strengthening the hacker centers and hacker movement. So please uh, come forward, uh, do it, enjoy it, and have a great time. So thank you very much for your presence, and I will see you later on. Bye. Um, All right, a uh, quick mic check. Is it fine? Yes. All right, so at the beginning, a small disclaimer from me. Usually, I get really nervous at the stage, but I really like this trill. It should be off in like about a few minutes. So, luckily for us, 
By the end of this presentation, I should be fine on the stage, so afterwards just ask me some questions. And now, right now, we're moving to my presentation. My name is Slavomir Japs, and I'm a member of the Confidence Organizing Crew. And this presentation will be about the conference we have annually in May in Krakow in Poland. So, next slide, please. What am I going to talk about? We'll answer four W questions. What is the confidence? Where will it be held? When? Why should you come to it? And after, at the end, I have a small bonus for you. All right, so next slide, please. First of all, what is confidence? We are doing this conference for almost eight years now. This year, we have like the 10th edition. It started as, as a small project for just the Polish community, but right now it's much more international. Most of the talks are held in English. We have lots of workshops and villages around. What do we have? For in plans for this year. We have like two days of the conference, which will be divided into two tracks every day. We'll have discussion panels on the most current topics in the IT security industry in Poland. And then we have lots of social activities connected with the conference. It's not only about the technical part, it's also about the many types of villages. We had, we had the lock picking villages, uh, some old computer style villages, we have everything. Last year, we also have like Capture the Flag, Quake 3 Arena contests, we even had a special map for the Quake 3 Arena, which was like resembling the whole place we had. Maybe some of you do remember that we also had this special map for the CCC camp this year. We just made a camp which was inside the Quake 3 Arena, you could play it. Next slide, please. All right, so where will it happen? First of all, we are in Poland, and we are visiting in Krakow, and usually the conference is held in Krakow. You have to come to this place, it's really a magical city. It used to be a capital of the country, right now it's not, but it's still a capital of the cultural part of the country. So, at the topmost you see the picture of, of the Krakow itself and the main market, but then, Last year we had a really good occasion and we found out an old water pumping station. It's located near the city, it's still in the city actually. And we had a full access to it. What you see on the picture is that this uh, red bricks around. It looks like a factory, it's totally industrial. There are still some running pumps downstairs which are pumping water for like the zoo which is nearby. It still works but they're trying to shut it down at some time in the future so they allowed us to enter this place. So this year we'll have confidence also in this area and it's really crazy. That's why it brings us to the industrial style. You will see that there are lots of like industry workers and everything around which is still working so you have to see it. Next slide please. All right, when will it happen? Usually we have the confidence in May so this year there's no exception from that. The dates we've chosen are 23rd and 24th of May. And you are all invited to come to the conference. By the way, I've just put a small part of the calendar there because this is the working week we have from the 21st to the 26th, which is Saturday. Before the confidence itself, we will have another conference about the web page, uh, web, web systems, front ends and the back ends and everything. And after the confidence, we will have a huge LAN party for the Polish guys and for the uh, game geeks who are really coming to, the, to our place. So you can just prepare yourself for even having like the whole week in Krakow and at that at some point step into the confidence. All right, next slide please. Why should you come? First of all, this Extend is this our... <laughs> is it the time? One minute. All right. You have to come there. It's a technical conference, but we have a huge underground style and everything's fine. I'm just skipping to the bonus part. Oh, this year. Last year we had the Gringo Warrior, which was like a mix of the contest for uh, lock pickers. You had to like set yourself free from the prison, then get over your documents and leave the area. This year we're going even further. If you see this marking on the plants, there is a bunker hidden at, the, at, the, at one part of the whole area. And we, we got the blueprints for the whole bunker and we're gonna prepare like a spy games inside it. We have, we'll have motion detectors, you will have to sneak past the guard, maybe like somehow stick to him and of course save the princess. All right, next slide for me and this is the contact information and by the way, I really enjoyed the traffic light signs you have here. Thank you very much.
This year we'll have like 250 nope, nope, attendees. Nope, nope. Done. Done. You can ask me later on, thank you. Okay. okay. Go, go, Eric. So, um, yeah. Just, just introduce it and then I'll close the lighting talks. Okay, great. Um, my name is Mitch Altman and uh, uh, this is kind of ad hoc, but uh, a few of us are going to talk about geeks and depression and suicide. This is a fantastically uplifting part, a way to end uh, 28C3 in the lightning talks. But we're actually going to make it, uh, at least I'm going to introduce it as something uh, worthwhile and maybe even a little entertaining. Uh, the thing is... Um, yeah. Just, uh, just let me close the lightning talks. Oh, so Nick's going to close the lightning talks.